Does this work too? Oh boy, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. You're going to have a little uh, Bob and Al show or uh, Humpty Brinkley, whatever you want to call it. But uh, Al and I are going to talk about the uh, F100. Before we get going, uh, I wanted to let you know that Al and I aren't really stupid about just coming in against you guys as a two ship. We brought in a few other uh, F100 and uh, aviators. I've got uh, to cover a little bit of our story when we get further down the road on Vietnam. I got uh, Brigadier General uh, retired Tip Clark. Tip, would you stand up and just let the people see? Tip's, Tip's going to tell us a little bit about his time in the 100 in Vietnam. And uh, got Buzzy Lynch. Buzz, would you just stand up for everybody? Buzzy. Uh, Buzzy uh, flew the F-100 a couple thousand hours. He, he did a lot of ocean crossings, uh, refueling behind KB-50s and things like that. And to cover some of the weasel missions that we're going to be talking about, the F-100 flew and was the first weasel mission. It was a 105 weasel pilot, Gordy Jenkins. Gordy, would you stand up? Retired Air Force Colonel. By the way, uh, Buzzy Lynch, who uh, did a lot of refueling in the Hun, was also happened to be the the first uh, Air Force pilot to fly the A-10, he ran the A-9 and A-10 evaluation, so he's the reason we got the Warthog, and uh, we're proud of him for that. We got some other people here. I know that uh, Dale Greenemeyer, who all of you know, uh, also flew the F-100, the Tucson Guard, and Daryl's got uh, lots of other stories, and you've had some of his presentations here, but who other, who what other 100 driver? We got one back here, you said, 100 driver. Any other 100 drivers here? Where are you? Oh yeah, Larry. Larry Spicer. Okay. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six. We got a we got a, about a, a four ship plus two to cover most of your questions, and we'll try to uh, try to get it, keep it relatively short. How many uh, other Vietnam vets do we have here? Good handful. Okay, great, great. And uh, I have to say this because this is mostly an Air Force show. How many naval aviators are here? Right here. Now there's enough of those. Okay. okay. The F-100, the F-100 was kind of the workhorse of the air of the tactical air forces in uh, in the late 1950s, 1960s. Pretty much ended its flying career in the early 70s. Although it flew in the guard a little bit later on, and flew in some foreign countries. The uh, uh, F-100 was similar. Any A-4 drivers? Here? Okay, we got one A-4 driver. A-4 in the Navy was, I think, the, tact the tactical attack airplane uh, for the Navy, similar to what the F-100's mission was for the, for the Air Force. So uh, they're, they're pretty similar airplanes, pretty similar in, uh, in uh, vintage as well. The, uh, whoops, better get going in the right direction. First flight of the F-100 was in 1953 flown by a uh, North American test pilot uh, by the name of George Welch. George Welch also is famous for his uh, flights in P-40s at Pearl Harbor, if you remember that movie. Who were those two guys that were in that movie, Al? Do you remember that? Uh... Anyway, George Welch was one of those two guys that took off P-40s during the attack on Pearl Harbor. He later went to work for North American, became a test pilot, made the first flight in May of 53. The airplane was pretty much designed to replace the F-86 and the F-84. Uh, George Welch, the guy who had that first flight, was killed about a year, year and a half later, flying an F-100 airplane, came apart on him at about 1.5 times the speed of sound, and uh, he was killed. Uh, other, lots of other famous pilots uh, that flew the F-100, of course, the one that just passed away his last year that we all knew and loved so well was Bob Hoover who could really put on a demo on that airplane. First fighter, supersonic and level flight. Actually, the Soviet MiG-19 was also capable of that, so there's an argument over who was first. The various models of the F-100 built, uh, the prototype airplane 53, the 100A and 54, First operational unit was at George Air Force Base up here at Victorville. They had a whole bunch of accidents in the fall of 1954, and uh, the 100 had some shortcomings, short tail, 
gall instability, uh, all sorts of problems in the 100A. They corrected some of them in the C model and then later was replaced by the D model. I think that there were, if I remember correctly, somewhere about uh, 100 A's. The C models were like 450, I think. I think there were about 1,200 D's and uh, three or 400 F's. The two plays came along a little bit later on and the F was, of course, used to check out people in the airplane, although Al Dempsey will tell us in a little while about his check out in the F-100 before the F came along. Um, almost 3,000 of them built. A lot of them lost. Uh, about 700,000. Tip Clark told me I was wrong on that number. He said it was really only about 625,000 when it got started. North American airplane flew, the airplane flew Besides the U.S. Air Force, Turkey, Taiwan, France, and Denmark, I will tell you about uh, our F-100D out at the Air Museum that uh, we got back from Turkey um, in a roundabout fashion. I'm going to let Al talk a little bit about his checkout of the F-100. I'm going to start back here because I have to have notes. I'm not as good as Bob when I stand there and talk. Um, uh, my first flight in an F-100 was on uh, October 30th, 1957. But before I get into that, I want to—I always want to bring you up on a little history about fighters in the in the early Cold War. Uh, everybody knows that uh, SAC at that time had the bombers, the B-47s, and later a little later the B-52s. But most people don't realize that in the early 50s, uh, SAC had seven wings of fighter planes. Originally they were to be, they were escort fighter wings and they were supposed to protect the, the, the B-29s. Um, but when the, when the B-47s came along and the F-84F came out with the, with the LOBS, a low altitude bombing system, uh, SAC changed the mission of all those wings to be uh, <coughs> special weapons of the rear aircraft uh, with uh, training to uh, do standby and have targets in, in Russia and the other Cold, Cold War company, countries. <coughs> My last flight in F-84 was uh, on the 1st of uh, October 1957 and uh, that gave me a week to go through ground school to learn how to fly the F-100. Gosh, you gotta realize in those days there, there were no simulators. Two-seat version wasn't out yet. And uh, the top technology in those early F-100s is basically the same as a World War II technology. Uh, no computers, no radar, uh, minimum radios, but we would be flying about twice as fast as the as a, as a World War II planes. The training was uh, with a blackboard, a projector, and the famous Dash 1, which of course was the aircraft manual. And uh, we, we learned the systems, the electrical, hydraulic, fuel, armament, and the flight characteristics with a heavy emphasis on the speeds. Okay, after a uh, final check, uh, it was time to uh, have a first flight. And uh, I had a briefing, uh, and my IP was a gentleman by the name of Asa D. Herring. Uh, Asa was a World War II pilot and was a Tuskegee Airman, although that term was never used in those days. That came, of course, came later. But uh, he, was, he, he was a great instructor for me. And uh, <clears throat> When, I, when we walked out to the airplane and I walked up to the shiny new airplane, it had just been delivered from the factory uh, about three days before. I had about 12 hours on it and I'm climbing into a brand new airplane for my first flight. When you climb in that airplane, <clears throat> you put it on, you know. Uh, you you got you to uh, do the shoulder saps and the, and the, and the seat belt gets snug. The radio, you all know pilots know about all this, but the headphone, the mic, the G suit, and don't forget the safety pins and the ejection seat. Got to pull those and stick them in that that uh, 
uh, pocket in your, in, your, in your pants, on the right leg of your pants. <clears throat> then it's time to head out for the, for the active runway, and away we go. Um, first flight, you go full power, of course, with the brakes on. Uh, give Ace a nod. We're ready to go, release the brakes into afterburner. And uh, you know, there's a bang, but you really don't hear much with your, with your uh, headset on, but you sure feel it when you go from 10,000 pounds of prop thrust to 17,000 pounds of thrust. <clears throat> so, normally we, we would, on that first mission, we, uh, we climb up to 20,000 feet, burner comes out at about 300 knots, and you know, you do the normal air work, uh, first time up, uh, Slow flight, flaps down, flaps up, speed brakes out, gear down, gear up, all that good stuff. And of course, then it's time to come home. And in those days, we did what we called a jet penetration. Uh, I was based at Tinker Air Force Base, and uh, they had a, an NDB just north of the field, and uh, you fly that NB and do the uh, uh, <coughs> do the, the penetration. Uh, <laughs> And then and in five minutes, uh, you're from 20,000 feet down to about 2,800 feet in a teardrop pattern. And uh, you're landing south, so the runway is dead ahead of you when you come off the NDB and enter initial. And you do, you do your, uh, your pattern, and you know, it's the first time. You're, you're, really, you're really cautious, but you want to watch the speeds. Watch the speeds. Come around. Uh, Touchdown, just past the numbers. Ooh, almost a grease job, but a pretty good landing. But it's not over. You're still going 160 knots. You got to pull that pair, that uh, handle for the drag chute. It pops out. That's good news. And uh, uh, you slow down. And at the end of the runway, you drop the drag chute. And there's an airman sitting in the pickup truck, and he runs out and grabs it before uh, Asa, who's landing behind me. Uh, uh, runs over it. So we uh, we end up uh, uh, in the back in the ops doing a debriefing, but the flight went well, and so uh, it didn't last very long. In total, for the checkout, there were 12 missions, um, and uh, they included, of course, uh, instruments, and we did GCAs. Um, you have to realize in those days, uh, that was before ATC, there was no air traffic control. Uh, we get above 20,000 feet, we had the sky all to ourselves. Uh, Tinker, once in a while, we'd see a, a B-36 coming out of, out, of, out of Fort Worth, uh, headed north on a training mission, but, but there were no airlines up there, and we didn't have to talk to anybody on the ground until we came back to land. <clears throat> So that's the story about my, my checkout. Uh, I'm going to pass the uh, baton back to, uh, to Bob now as, as we learn how to uh, make this airplane a fighting machine. The, uh, there's a famous uh, video that they showed all F-100 pilots called uh, Too Late, Too Late or Saber Dance. And uh, that's a video you can find on YouTube. Just uh, search F-100 Saber Dance or Too Late, Too Late. It's about a less than one minute video, but it's a story of a, a young pilot who was a, uh, flying for the ferry outfit out of, uh, uh, I think he was out of, might have been out of Wichita or Donaldson. But uh, he was taking off, taking an airplane off from uh, Edwards. And on the pre-flight, he missed the fact that they hadn't reconnected the nose gear scissors. So when they took off, the nose gear just extended right on out with no nose gear scissors attached. So the doors came up and came up on the door. He put the gear back down, and, and they decided it'd be smart for him to go with this extended nose gear over to Edwards and land. And uh, there was another emergency in progress over at Edwards. And the end of the story is sad because the guy got behind the power curve, as I was talking about, you watch your airspeed, and he got behind the power curve and he was trying to slow down to get, to work his way around to the runway, around this other emergency, and he got the nose too high, the airspeed too low, he tried to light the afterburner, lit it pretty quickly, got some compressor stalls, wound up rolling the ball of fire. They showed, and he was killed, obviously. He was a, uh, he was a young lieutenant, 
And uh, they showed all of us that video before they uh, checked us out of the airplane to make sure that we would pay attention to airspeed. It was actually a nice airplane. I, 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 flew it, I flew it for a bunch of years. I was an IP in the back seat and a man of average stature that I am. I love landing, landing from that back seat because you couldn't see shit from China. <laughs> anyway, uh, on, on to the stories of what the F-100 did. When it started out, most of its years were spent in the Cold War time frame and it was a tactical nuclear weapons delivery airplane. We practice that. That was our main mission to uh, deliver a nuclear weapon. Um, I remember my target was in uh, south western Poland, Soviet Union at the time. I always joked with people, said I was bomb bombing my grandfather's hometown because I am Polish, if you couldn't tell. Uh, Victor Alert was what it was called, the alert that we sat and we, uh, we planned targets, did low level missions. Um, the airplanes, the hundreds of F-100s that were flying, they were stationed in Europe, were stationed in the States. They had to go and get there, and one of the, the only way you could get across the oceans was to in-flight refuel. Um, it was mentioned that Buzzy Lynch did a lot of KB-50 refueling. I did a little bit of that, and I refueled from uh, the 135 a lot in the 100. I think the tanker story, Gary Luders is one of our tanker pilots that's here, um, I think the tanker was probably the most important airplane that we had both in the Cold War and in Vietnam and the tankers today. We couldn't do our tactical mission, either the Air Force or the Navy, without tankers. The, uh, it was interesting, uh, I said this, the F-100 mission was part of the SIAP. That's a single integrated operational plan in which some grand planner had decided that all of the strategic bombers, all the missiles, all the submarine launch missiles, missiles and all of the uh, weapons delivered by the F-100 were all integrated in a single plan. We'd go out and we'd hit all the targets that we needed to in the, in the Soviet Union and uh, hopefully wouldn't get blown out of the sky by one of our other guys' bombs going off. Time over target was very critical. This thing was planned in a grandiose fashion. The uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, you remember that in October of 62, Blaine Mack has talked about that, his war stories here. All of us that flew F-100s at that time went on extended nuclear alert. Our wing in Lake and Heath, England, where I flew, was uh, went from um, 12 airplanes on alert to 36 airplanes on alert. I was a young lieutenant sitting on top of a 1.2 megaton Mark 43 bomb. Think about that, that's several times beyond what was dropped at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So what did we do? How did we deliver these nuclear weapons in the F-100s? It's called an over-the-shoulder maneuver, a lapse maneuver. You get going on the deck at 500 knots, uh, 50 feet, 100 feet off the ground, fly over the target that you're going to hit, you're, you're light the afterburner if you already weren't in burner, pull four Gs in about two seconds, and pull it up, and about 90 degrees the bomb would release, and you fly an implement out of the back of it, get out of dodge, the bomb would go up some several thousand feet above you, reverse its direction, come down and hit somewhere on the ground. I remember the uh, delivery scores in those days. You were qualified as a weapons delivery, nuclear weapons delivery pilot to get within 1,500 feet. That's, uh, that doesn't sound like it's uh, a very uh, close to the, to the target kind of weapon, but it also, uh, remember you were delivering a, several hundred uh, kilotons or megaton weapons, so you didn't have to get very close to do your job. We flew it, how did you deliver this thing in an over the shoulder move? It was basically flying a high speed acrobatic ILS maneuver. 500 knots, get going along on the deck, cage, uncage the gyro, the needle would drop down to about 60 degrees, you'd, and then you'd be flying over a target, pull it up, and you'd, if you get that needle back up to zero, that was controlling your release for your uh, computed ballistic release of the weapon, and the vertical needle, you'd fly it, and you really had to keep those wings pretty level. Sometimes the gyro would precess. There's one more story of a pilot by the name of Speedy Moore that was flying with me down at Wheelis in a practice delivery, 
and at OIT arrange, as Dr. West at Tripoli, he was doing one of these. He kept the needle perfectly centered. He thought he was right on. He didn't realize that the thing was precessing, and he was doing, instead of a, an implement, he was doing kind of a clover relief. He threw it around 3,000 feet to the left of the target, and uh, land, unfortunately landed on the top of, a, of an Arab out in the middle of the desert who was collecting up old brass from our uh, previous missions that we had out there. They used to collect the brass and pound it out and sell it back to us in brass plates. Anyway, the poor, poor Arab was killed. We speedy war landed. We got him out of trip. We got him out of Libya with that same day, so that the uh, locals wouldn't come after him. Another depiction of the maneuver, strictly in a moment. That was our main. We, while we're doing this practice mission, and we practice it over and over and over again, we also were keeping current in air to air, shooting against the dart, strafing, dropping bombs, dive bombs, all sorts of. Uh, normal conventional weapons delivery that you had to be qualified in, but this was your main mission. That's a picture of a Mark 7, looks a little bit like a fuel tank, about a 2,000 pound. Al, what was the delivery on that? How, how big was that one? 2018 uh, or that, so? uh, that was uh, 1,680 pounds. But how, and, and nuclear weapons, what was the yield on it? Oh, uh, that was about the same as a Hiroshima and uh, about 20 kilotons. That's just another depiction of the bomb coming off. As I said, Nagasaki was 15, so the Mark 7 was somewhere in that range. Mark 43 that I stood on was one megaton. Remember, there was 10 fighter bomber wings and 12 air national guard units, all, all having this mission to perform. In the early days, some of the 100 missions were air defense, and then of course, a lot of the tactical uh, fighter kind of work that we came to later on in Vietnam. This was Cold War days. So you come along, in starting in the early 1960s and the F-100 was deployed and nearly every single F-100 squadron was deployed to Vietnam over its years. Flew a lot of sorties, a lot of losses. I'd like to give the mic to Tip Clark who flew 100 missions in Vietnam and give us a short version of a war story, Tip, about Vietnam. Tip is a retired Air Force BG, Brigadier General. He hung around longer than I did. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <coughs> Uh, I flew the F-100 from uh, 1966 to 1970. I have about a thousand hours in it, which included uh, a tour in Vietnam uh, from January of 67 to January of 68. Uh, I flew the airplane in the 90th Attack Fighter Squadron, which was located at Benoit Air Base, which was about 60 miles north of Saigon, now called Ho Chi Minh City. By the way, uh, Actually, Vietnam was two wars. We had the guys like Buzzy and Gordy, the guys with the big balls. They went north for 100 missions. We did all of our fighting in the, uh, in the South Vietnam with a mission we call Close Air Support. I'll give you the official uh, meaning of Close Air Support. Air action against hostile targets that are in close proximity to friendly forces and require detailed integration of each mission. Now in fighter pilot language, that's we flew really fast and really low and dropped a bunch of bad shit on guys that were close to the friendlies. So uh, the missions that we had over there specifically were, uh, some were very mundane like LZ prep, landing zone preps which were basically dropping great big bombs in the trees to clear them out so the Army could come in in their helicopters and, uh, and land and uh, set up a base camp or whatever they wanted to do to get uh, close to what they were trying to get done. Another mission uh, that we flew was uh, against uh, mobile and fixed targets. And the most important mission that we did was uh, troops in contact. Whenever the Army or the Marine Corps would call, or they had the VC, or even in some cases, North Vietnamese Army coming over the concertina wire, they would call, and we would scramble, regardless of the weather, and go out and uh, try to help them uh, get through the skirmish. I think that, uh, uh, let me, uh, I had about a, uh, 276 missions, 
and uh, 276 takeoffs, 275 landings. I had to eject uh, in the middle of the night. And uh, well, that's a whole story for another day, but um, I got the question a lot. They said, well, were you scared? I said, well, no, I wasn't scared, but I could see in the dark and you couldn't have driven a nail up my ass. <laughs> but the Army picked me up out of the jungle and brought me back, and I was able to uh, finish my tour and, uh, and go home. As uh, Tony Cushenberry, a very famous 105 pilot, said, who's along with uh, Billy Sparks, a good friend of mine, uh, who's now passed away, but when they were on the uh, Flying Channel and uh, War Stories, you've all seen those on, on uh, TV, Tony said, all I wanted to do was get over there, do the job to the best of my ability, and come home to my family. I think all of us felt that way. And uh, I don't think we ever lost a battle, and we didn't lose the war, our politicians gave it away. Anyway, uh, some of the other missions that we did over there was uh, we escorted the uh, C-123s, which was a cargo aircraft that was converted to spray, and that was, you've all heard the word uh, Agent Orange, which are dioxins, and by the way, you can still buy Agent Orange today at Home Depot. It's called Roundup. It's the same basic stuff. And uh, we have a lot of vets to this day that are suffering from the Agent Orange with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. I happen to, got, to have gotten uh, leukemia from it, but uh, I'm going to be hanging around a while. Hopefully, I can come down again next year to see you guys. Thanks. The, uh, besides all the close air support kind of work that Tip did uh, when he was in Vietnam, by the way, there were nearly every F-100 squadron was deployed, and there were also, uh, I think, four guard squadrons deployed in, in 68, so nearly all the F-100s that were in existence uh, pulled their weight in Vietnam. One of the missions that they did in the early days was uh, uh, wild weasel mission. This was F-100F, in which they put a pilot in the front seat, an EWO in the back seat, put some special gear on board the airplane. Um, a friend of, of a lot of ours, uh, who's a little guy right in the middle in the back row in that picture, Gary Willard, was the father of wild weasels. And uh, I did some escort. My, uh, my instructor pilot was the first uh, wild weasel pilot shot down over North Vietnam, and he was a prisoner of war for eight years. But um, Gordy Jenkins flew a whole pile of wild weasel missions in the F-105. Gordy, you want to say a word or two about the weasel mission? You don't have to get up. I know you got a bad ankle. Yep. Stay down. Well, the thing about uh, F-105, we had two weapons. The, uh, the big Livet that weighed about 1,800 pounds, and then the, the uh, Shrike. Uh, we always, the, the philosophy was get rid of the, uh, the uh, AGM-78 first because it was uh, so restrictive to your maneuverability. And so we'd fire those boys off about 30 miles away from the target, and it could seek off course site. Uh, if, you, if you locked on a, a SAM site to the right or left, it would follow that signal. And we, the timing of it was important because we were out in front of the strike force, and so we would uh, try to be there and firing missiles when the strike force is rolling in so that the, the enemy would be a little reluctant to come up with their signals. And so uh, we would fire that off, but the, the strike, you'd have to actually point at the target, pull up to 15 or so degrees and pick it off, and then it would arc out and over and, and uh, hit the target. Gordy's, Gordy's giving you the technical stuff on the actual weapons, but remember what this mission was. This was, uh, these were guys with uh, superior size uh, cojones. They went out and let ask the missile sites to light them up and shoot at them, and they duck the missiles and go in and kill the missile sites. That was what the weasel mission was. And it, uh, the F-100F F started it, decided a little bit later on that the 105 could do the mission a little bit better, so they had a two-seat 105 that did it. Later on, it evolved into the F-4, and Gordy was a squadron commander of an F-4 weasel outfit. And then also today's day in our age, it's the F-16 that does that mission. One other mission, one, 
One other mission that uh, was a little bit different than the close air support mission was a forward air controller mission. Misty Facts were another bunch of guys, volunteers, who also were going into a very high risk zone. The forward air controller airplanes, you know, the O1s, the O2s, the OB10s, the guys that pointed out and marked the targets, so tipped the girl in with his F100 or Buzzy and his F4 and hit the targets. Um, those airplanes could not survive in North Vietnam where the enemy air defenses were very, very intense. So they decided to put what they call the fast back, the misty facts, into the business. So this was an F-100F, two seat, two pilots, pilot in the front doing most of the flying, guy in the back seat doing mostly observing with a camera and things, and they actually controlled, spotted targets, hit targets in North Vietnam. A lot of these guys, a lot of these guys were, were uh, were shot down, a lot of them were prisoners of war. But this was another mission that the, uh, that the F-100 did, and this was the F model. One of our uh, famous F-100 pilots, Colonel Bud Day, was Misty One. Actually, the call sign Misty came because that was his wife's nickname. Um, the uh, lot of different, uh, all volunteers, uh, one one of our local guys. Uh, any other Misty Fact? Any of you guys flew the 100 or any Misty Fact work? You know, did, did you tip? Um, Dick Rutan, you know, Bert Rutan's brother. Dick has been here quite a bit at Old Bowl Pilots. He was a Misty Fact. He was shot down. <laughs> he has a fun war story about his, his mission. He was shot down, but he was recovered. Um, but Day was shot down, captured, prisoner of war. In the, in, Hanoi Hilton for many years and received the Medal of Honor for his leadership roles in North Viet in, uh, in the prison prisoner camps in North Vietnam. I'm wearing a, a POW bracelet, by the way, of my flight commander, Norm Schmidt, who we dedicated our F-104 to out at the Air Museum. Norm was captured on a shot down on a mission. I was, I was flying with him in uh, September the 1st, 1966. He was we couldn't get to him. Two Sandy A1s were going in and try to help him. One of those guys was killed. The other guy was shot up pretty bad. I escorted him back to the Nakhon Phanam where he jumped out. Norm was picked up, captured, prisoner of war, tortured to death, died about a year later in camp. So the prisoner of war story is a new feature, if you will, out at the Air Museum. So if you come out, please pay a little bit of attention to our prisoner of war missing in action display. The Thunderbirds also flew the F-100. They loved the F-100. They, they started out, when they first started flying the 100, they flew it for a while. Air Force says, why don't you graduate to the 105? They started flying the 105, figured out the 105 was not suitable for the kind of air shows that they were doing. They went back to the 100, and they flew the 100 for 13 years. Um, I'm going to let Al talk a little bit about the, our airplane out at the museum. Yeah, we, we were fortunate to acquire a, a uh, an F-100 for the museum. As you know, we, the Air Museum started out as a World Tour II museum and about six years ago we decided to move on and, and add uh, aircraft from the, the Korean uh, and Vietnam eras. And we've done a pretty good job. We've got all the Century Series now except the 101. And uh, uh, we we got this uh, AAA uh, was the uh, aircraft that we discovered uh, sitting on the ramp up at uh, up at Reno Air, Air Force Base. It had, it had flown in intact in for about uh, 10 years, ended up uh, over in Spain for uh, about six years, and finally ended up in Turkey, where the Turks flew the airplane for almost 20 years. It was, it was sitting on their ramp, and uh, uh, Tracon, a uh, commercial outfit that pulled uh, tow targets for F-104 target practice in Germany wanted to get some F-100s to do that job and they retrieved uh, AAA and brought it back to the States with with two other F-100s. It's, it's an interesting story of how they flew those three planes back from Turkey to to uh, uh, Edwards, Edwards Air Force Base area in uh, 1989. In any event, uh, it was actually, it was civilianized, it has an end number on it and uh, the guns were taken out and it flew air shows and did that kind of thing. It never did pull uh, targets in Germany. And uh, it ended up on the ramp, uh, uh, its last flight was in 2008, 
and I was sitting there with a for a sale, for a sale sign on, and uh, I went up and looked at it and uh, uh, made a deal. Uh, and as you can see, it was uh, delivered by truck. Uh, we didn't fly it. Uh, they took it apart, took the wings off, and it arrived uh, in January of uh, 2015. Okay. Uh, we had an unveiling uh, in November, and as you can see, uh, there are a, about 25 happy F-100 pilots that uh, attended that program, uh, and they, uh, they really all enjoyed it. Uh, <clears throat> they all got to sign the, uh, the airplane, and they all got to climb in the cockpit. The airplane is functional. We didn't put a battery in it. The lights all lit up. And there was there was not a dry eye in those F-100 pilots when they climbed out of that airplane. Uh, okay. <clears throat> there is still one F-100 flying on a regular basis that we are aware of. It was one of the three that flew back from Turkey in 1989. It's an F model, and uh, it's owned by Dean Cutshaw, who uh, uh, operates out of Fort Wayne, Indiana, and. Uh, uh, there are, if you want to go uh, on YouTube, uh, he put on a great performance at Oshkosh uh, last year, and there's a lot of good pictures that you can see of an Air Force that's currently flying. And if you're really interested, you can go to Fort Wayne and uh, uh, hand Dean a, a $10,000 bill and they'll give you a ride for 30 minutes in that airplane. But anyway, yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Super Saver uh, Society. Um, this was uh, founded, I think, I got my notes here, 2006, um, <clears throat> by uh, retired Colonel uh, Les Frater, yeah, 2006. The mission of the society is to preserve the history of the F-100 Super Saver and the, and the men who flew her. Uh, the, the, the society meets in a biennial convention and... Uh, they get together and drink in Vegas in April. <laughs> you, can, you can see that's a picture of, uh, of the last convention that was held at the uh, Air Force Museum in, in, in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, there's, uh, there's our old friend uh, uh, Bob Hoover, uh, pr probably one of his very last uh, uh, adventures into uh, uh, being in the public. And as you, and as you can see, uh, there's a little sneaky me in the back row back there. Uh, I kind of snuck out of the tail end when I'm taking that picture. Well, to end this whole thing, we like to, to say that uh, uh, the hunt had a proud history, and we at the museum, of course, uh, like to remember General Ken Miles, uh, who was our uh, benefactor and board chairman at the museum for many years. Uh, Ken flew the hundred, uh, flew the Hun, uh, 337 combat missions, while commander of the 614th Tech Fighter Squadron, the Lucky Devils in Vietnam. So that closes our program, and I guess we're ready for questions. Yeah. Bob, you have some more? Well, no, I didn't have anything else said, but we did want to open it up for questions. Uh, anybody got any questions you want to start off with? If not, I'll give back to Mike to a couple of these people. Philip? So, when you were releasing the tactical nuclear weapons, did you have to do anything to stabilize the instruments so they wouldn't fall apart? Because you said you had Yeah, it was, uh, there was a jar where you had to uncage it. There was an uncaging mechanism, so you, you get going at, at, uh, at the delivery airspeed, and uh, you had to make sure that your wings level and just just uncage the gyro, and then the gyro would take over, and that let the the output from those gyros was displayed on that lab screen that I showed up there. You have to remember, those were. I just want to add one more thing. Those were solo missions, map in the lap. You know, you just you flew to the target, and uh, you had to know where you. And of course, it was a mission you'd never done before because we didn't fly over there. To practice or anything, we never had to. We never had to drop one. Thank God. And we never had to drop one. It never went. Question here: Was the Megaton bomb a hydrogen bomb? Yes, Mark Forty Three. Mark Forty Three in particular was uh, was a hydrogen bomb. You know, implosion versus 
the uh, uranium, if you want to call it, fat boy, big boy things of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. One was fusion, one was, I can't remember the other term. Wait a minute. Navy pilot question. Uh, John Boyd, 42nd Boyd, didn't mention him. Who's that? John Boyd. Boyd. John Boyd. Yeah, um, what do you want to know about John Boyd? John Boyd was a good pilot. He said that, uh, you know, he'd take you off at Nellis, put you on the wing, and, and he'd say, okay, let's split. And he said he could be on your tail in 30 seconds. There's a lot of war stories. There's a couple of good books about him. Uh, he actually lost a bet one time to a young, I think he lost it to Billy Sparks, I'm not sure. Do you remember that story, Tim? Anyway, 32nd uh, Boyd is a guy. He also, John Boyd would, went, later went to the Pentagon. He was the father of a lot of concepts, one of which was the famous energy maneuverability. If you've ever studied your own tactical flying manuals and stuff, he had a thing called piece of S, but basically it was just airspeed and altitude. If you're high, you can exchange the altitude for airspeed. If you got airspeed, you can exchange it for altitude in simple terms. He was an air-to-air -air guy. Um, all our missions, basically in the hunt, were air to ground. Um, except when we were having fun, we'd go and knock each other. Well, we did shoot at sleeves and stuff. Gary, you got a question way back? Yeah, maybe Gordy could explain to us about Wild Weasel, the YGBSM acronym. Gordy? started that weasel mission concept and the F-100 had a line after he got his volunteer set up and he said one of his pilots said now tell me again Gary you're going to do what to whom with what and you and that's where YGBSM came from it was a very very high risk probably the most of the missions that we flew in, in uh, North Vietnam I flew the 104 did some escort of 105 weasel missions I did hundred missions up north in the 104, but of the, all the missions that were flown, the Weasel was probably the most dangerous mission, except for one. Anybody know what that other most dangerous mission was? I bet you the A4 pilot can tell me. Coming back around the carrier at night in crappy weather in the Gulf. Anyway, that that to me was probably a higher risk mission. There were some there were some studies that were were run, and they wired up some Navy pilots. And they're, uh, you know, for pulse rates and heart rates and blood pressures and stuff. And uh, coming back aboard the carrier was a hell of a lot uh, higher blood pressure, higher heart rate than ducking missiles up in North Vietnam. But uh, when you when you see those missiles coming at you, it does get you some pretty big eyeballs, right? Great. Questions? There's another. There's a couple other back here. Anybody else? We're gonna cut it. We're gonna get to, to go home early today if you don't want to ask any more questions. We. And uh, the guy in the back seat, Norm Frith, had a very high voice, and he says, "Lunch, lunch, eleven o'clock." And I looked over there. I'm on, I'm on the left wing, about six thousand feet down. And I look over, and there it is. It's like a telephone pole coming up with smoke off the bottom of it. I said, well, goddamn, look at that!" And it's starting to arc over. It goes well above us, and the flight lead does what we call a lift two maneuver. Lift the burner lower the nose, pick up a lot of airspeed, so you've got plenty of maneuverability if, if, you, if there is such a thing in the long fly. But, but we're, we're heading downhill, and I'm watching this missile go way up above us, and I said, well, shit, you know, I'm in the same line as he is. I'm going to make the missile here decide which one he's going to get. So I did a big barrel roll, and now I'm back here behind flight lead. The missile was locked on him, and so I got to watch this thing. It was the most amazing e-ticket uh, e ride you'd ever see. Each year, 
the missile's here. Just before it attack, the, the limb two maneuver is just before the missile gets to you, you suck in as many G's as you can and you turn as tight as you can on a 90 degree angle from the missile. The missile then tries to follow it, and I'm watching this from behind. The missile does sideways maneuver and explodes in proximity fuse. He hits just, the missile hits just the back end of the airplane, shakes it a bit, a lot of fluid's coming out, but the guy in the back seat says, we're hit, we're hit. <laughs> and I got to follow him to you, Bob. <laughs> Any more? Thanks an awful lot, guys. Appreciate it.